Has it ever crossed your mind how a strategic retreat can lead to a monumental victory? This is exactly what happened during the Fifth Encirclement Campaign. The Fifth Encirclement Campaign was an integral part of the Chinese Civil War, a series of battles fought between September 1933 and October 1934. On one side we had Chiang Kai-shek's Chinese nationalists, a formidable force that managed to overrun the Communist Chinese Soviet Republic. The nationalists were a million strong, their ranks bolstered by various regional warlords. On the other side, the Chinese Soviet Republic, backed by the Red Army, a force of around 100,000 soldiers. The tide of war seemed to be favoring the nationalists, who had adopted a systematic strategy that included surrounding and blockading the Soviet, establishing fortified blockhouses and building roads for supply delivery. However, the communists, despite facing heavy casualties and loss of territory, saw an opportunity amidst the chaos, a strategic retreat that would later be known as the Long March. A seemingly hopeless situation turned into a strategic opportunity. That's the essence of the Fifth Encirclement Campaign. The campaign officially began on September 25, 1933, with a clear strategy from the Chinese nationalists. The nationalists, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, had a systematic plan in place. They were not simply launching into battle without forethought. They surrounded and blockaded the Chinese Soviet Republic, effectively cutting off their routes of escape and supply lines. But they didn't stop there. They established fortified blockhouses, creating a defensive grid that was difficult to penetrate. This wasn't just a show of force. It was a calculated move to squeeze the communists into submission, a chess game on a grand scale. Alongside this, the nationalists built roads to ensure smooth delivery of supplies to their troops. This efficient network of roads allowed them to sustain their forces and maintain their stronghold. Now let's talk numbers. The nationalist troops, a massive force of around 1 million, were mainly composed of forces under various regional commanders. They had an impressive 75 divisions and 8 independent regiments at their disposal. On the other hand, the Red Army was significantly smaller, with around 100,000 soldiers. The difference in numbers was stark, and it was clear who had the upper hand. The opening moves of this campaign saw the Red Army struggling to achieve any major victories. Despite their best efforts, they were unable to break out through the nationalists' defences. The blockades, the blockhouses, the sheer number of nationalist troops it all created a formidable wall that the Red Army could not breach. The nationalist blockhouse strategy proved effective, allowing them to advance and pushing the communists into a tight corner. The stage was set for the next phase of the campaign, a phase that would test the mettle of both sides in ways they could hardly have anticipated. In December 1933, the nationalists launched a second offensive. This was not just a mere maneuver, it was a full-scale, all-out attack aimed at wiping out the communist stronghold the nationalists were determined to bring a swift end to the communist resistance. The second offensive was marked by the joining of warlord forces to the nationalist attack. These warlords seeking to assert their own power and influence threw in their lot with Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists. Their participation added a new layer of complexity to the conflict, bringing the total attackers to one million and escalating the intensity of the battles. As the offensive raged on, the communists found themselves on the defensive suffering heavy losses. They were under constant, relentless attack from the well-equipped and well-organized nationalist forces. The communist lines were breached time and again. Their defenses crumbled, and they found themselves pushed back, losing ground continually. By April 1934, the situation had deteriorated to such an extent that several communist strongholds fell to the nationalists. These were not just any locations, these were key strategic points which held immense importance for the communists. Losing these bases meant eliminating their source of support and was akin to losing a part of their very identity. Despite the grim situation, the communists refused to surrender. They fought back with everything they had, launching desperate counterattacks against the nationalists. The communist international military leader, Otto Braun, advocated short, deep thrusts. But the nationalists, with their superior numbers and resources, managed to repel these attempts, driving the communists off and further reducing their territory. The communists faced a severe blow, with their territory shrinking rapidly. But even in the face of such adversity, they held on, refusing to give in. 
This was the beginning of a long, arduous struggle that would continue for many more months, shaping the future of China in ways no one could have anticipated. Despite their losses, the communists launched a counterattack, showcasing their resilience. Pinning their hopes on a swift and strategic offensive, they sought to regain lost ground. This was not a desperate last stand, but a testament to their indomitable spirit, a drive to keep the flame of their movement alive in the face of overwhelming odds. Throughout this period, the communists exhibited an incredible level of tenacity. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, many refused to surrender, instead opting to fight back and challenge the nationalist forces. This counterattack, however, was not without its costs. The Red Army suffered further casualties, a grim reminder of the reality of war, and many locals defected from the Reds to the nationalists. Meanwhile, the nationalists, under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, continued their systematic approach. The fortified blockhouses and supply roads they had built earlier proved their worth, allowing them to maintain a stranglehold over the communist forces. The nationalists' response to the counterattack was swift and decisive, further pushing the communists on the back foot. As the months passed, the situation grew increasingly dire for the communists. By April 1934, the communist strongholds began to fall, one after the other, to the nationalist onslaught. The Red Army was driven back, their counterattack quelled, and their territory reduced to a handful of strongholds. Most of the inhabitants gave up on the communists and began fleeing and defecting to the government. The communists imposed deadly punishments for abandoning their duties. By late September 1934, the Chinese Soviet Republic was left with only a few remaining strongholds. These final bastions of communist resistance were all that stood between the nationalists and total victory. The Red Army, battered and bruised, held on, knowing that the fate of their movement rested on their shoulders. With the fall of the last strongholds, the stage was set for the final act of the campaign. The curtain was about to fall on this intense chapter of the Chinese Civil War, but the story was far from over. The echoes of this struggle would reverberate through history, shaping the course of a nation and the lives of its people. Cornered and outnumbered, the communists made a decision that would change the course of Chinese history. In a desperate move, the Red Army, under the leadership of the Communist Party, chose to embark on what would be known as the Long March. This strategic retreat was not a sign of defeat, but a tactical decision to regroup and reorganize. It was a journey that spanned over a year and covered thousands of miles, taking the communists through some of the most challenging terrains in China. But why did they decide on such a perilous journey? The communist forces were significantly outnumbered. The nationalists had over one million soldiers, while the Red Army had around a hundred thousand. The nationalists' blockhouse strategy had the communists cornered and their territory was shrinking rapidly. The Red Army was left with only a few strongholds, Retreat, as dangerous as it was, seemed the only viable option. The Long March was not just a military maneuver. It was a test of endurance, a test of leadership, and a test of the Communist Party's resolve. It was during this time that the Communists built the grassroots support that would eventually propel them to power. The aftermath of the Fifth Encirclement Campaign was a turning point in the Chinese Civil War. The Communists, once cornered and on the brink of defeat, used the Long March to regroup and rebuild. They emerged from it stronger and more determined, eventually leading to their victory in the Chinese Civil War. The Fifth Encirclement Campaign, therefore, was not just a series of battles. It was a critical juncture in Chinese history, highlighting the resilience and strategic acumen of the Communist Party. It was a testament to the fact that sometimes, a strategic retreat can be more powerful than a head-on assault. The Fifth Encirclement Campaign ended not in a decisive victory, but in a strategic retreat that would shape the future of China. The Fifth Encirclement Campaign was more than just a series of battles. It was a turning point in the Chinese Civil War. A grand chess game of strategy and sacrifice, the campaign saw the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, overrun the Communist Chinese Soviet Republic, forcing the latter onto the defensive. The nationalists' systematic approach, including blockades, fortified blockhouses and supply roads, initially proved effective. However, the tides of war are ever-changing. The communists, despite suffering heavy losses,
didn't stay on the back foot for long. They launched a counterattack, their resilience and determination burning bright even as their territory dwindled. Yet, the campaign's true significance lies not in the battles fought, but in the strategic retreat that followed, the Long March. It was a journey of endurance, a testament to the indomitable spirit of the communists. In the face of adversity, the communists turned a potential defeat into a strategic opportunity, setting the stage for the epic Long March and their eventual rise to power. The Fifth Encirclement campaign, thus, was not an end, but a beginning a prologue to a story of resilience and revolution.